to worship God together this morning. I want to invite those of you who are here in person to grab those guest registers you can find on the inside aisle of each pew, sign those, pass them along, and even pass them back, take a look at who's sitting near you so that after worship you can say hello. An announcement this morning, just a reminder that it's a great time to sign up for small groups. If you're interested in checking out our offerings, we have a table that'll be in the lobby between services. Sign up is both online and in person, so feel free to check that out. Hey guys. (laughs) What are you guys up to? (laughs) What's going on here? (laughs) Hello everyone. We are cruising in for a cause this morning. I'm Matt Russell, this is Jay Carlson, and we're here to raise awareness about biking for the Congo challenge. Um, Every day in the Congo to get to medical care, most people travel by bike up to 50 kilometers. And even more so when they get there, um, there's a limited amount of supplies and a lack of trained staff that often prevent the people from actually getting better. There's a bullet, or in your bulletin, there's a link. You can find more information on the ride. Our missions group is supporting a Team Salem ride on October 8th after the second service, and we're going to uh, look to raise money. Um, We have a goal of $5,000 to support this great need. There'll be a bag lunch uh, that you can sign up for, and then multiple routes for the folks that are uh, gonna participate. And so we just humbly ask that if you can, participate and come along, and uh, check out the bulletin link as well. Um, It's got more information about the Congo as well as the ride. And we just humbly uh, look for your support and dedication. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you so guys. much. Good luck getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> Whoa. So even if you don't love uh, riding bicycles at this point, uh, being a part of the fundraiser by supporting the others who are riding, Paul Carlson Partnership is a really important arm of our denomination, doing fantastic work in Congo. We encourage you, walking, riding bicycles, donating, however you can be a part of this great mission in October, please join us. Let us continue in worship. Please stand as you're able as we um, join in the call to worship. I extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall lodge your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made.
almighty God, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, pour out your spirit upon us that we may grow in your image and live out your call in our lives, rejoicing in your love and sharing it with joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture readings have changed this morning. Our first one will be from Jonah, chapter 3, verses 10 through 4, uh, 11. Uh, the second will be Philippians, and Mark is going to be referring to Matthew later on. So, from Jonah. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is it not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishment. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat down under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on his head, on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. And then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you uh, did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who did not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And now we go to Philippians. Uh, chapter 1, verses 21 to 30, where Paul is writing from prison. Okay. For me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress in joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come again to you again. Only. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one another for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by, intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence 
of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege, not only believing in Christ, but suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that I saw, that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. 
awesome God, we humbly come before you today, the one who has created all things and put chaos into order, the one who knows all the days of our lives and hairs on our heads, and yet knows all the stars in the sky. There's nothing we can do to hide from your love, and also nothing we can do that is outside of your knowledge, and help us not to forget this. Give us generous hearts for others the way that your heart is generous for us. God, we lay at your feet our agendas, our brokenness, our pain, our sin, the things that we know that we should not be doing and the things we don't even realize we're doing, the things that are outside your will for us. God, give us teachable hearts, a fresh desire to serve you and a willingness to hear your voice. God, we pray for those who are grieving, recovering from illness and injury, those who are suffering at the hands of other people, those lonely and isolated, those who are facing injustice, devastation, and disaster. Give us hearts for justice and mercy in your name, and give us fresh eyes to truly see people as you do. Let your hope be renewed in all of us. God, we want to be a church community that loves you well, that loves others well, that seeks you in all things and doesn't forget what our purpose is here. So we thank you for the many provisions you generously give to us and pray for your continued guidance and understanding where you, where you will have us go and what you will have us do. We pray that this time of worship be pleasing and honoring to you. And together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Shelley Streeper now to come up uh, to give us a moment for mission about Living Hope International. Good morning. Today's moment for mission features Living Hope International, which is primarily based in Puebla, Mexico. To jog your memory, Salem Youth served there um, at Esperanza Viva Youth Home uh, in July. This is not to be confused with the ministry of the same name here in the Twin Cities that many of you went and served at yesterday. So thank you for that service. Just want to make sure we're tracking Living Hope International. All right, well, their mission is to share the gospel through church planting, rescue and raise at-risk children, train up the next generation of leaders and pastors. They've been at this for 30 years now, and while God has tremendously blessed their ministry, they almost feel like they're just getting started. Hence the theme of the benefit this year, which is only the beginning. Let's take a look at this video. Road can be difficult. Tough uncertain. Alone? The future can be scary. But together, we can dream. Together, we can accomplish anything. Together, we can climb the highest mountain. This this is only the beginning. So today at 2 o'clock, you are invited to a dessert benefit here at Salem to support the Ministry of Living Hope International. Attending this event will give you an understanding of what living the Matthew 25 call out day in and day out is like and the impact that it has on children's lives and families' lives and entire communities. It's also an opportunity to possibly learn how you might serve 
um, maybe at Esperanza Viva Youth Home or support this ministry in other ways. I really hope to see you there. Thank you, Shelley. Well, now we continue in our worship service with a time uh, where we give our tithes and offering, offerings in worship to God. And as we consider all the ways that God continues to stir our hearts to live into the mission that he has us on, we thank you for your continued generosity and your giving. <clears throat> there are several ways to give today. In person, as the plates are passed online, you can send a text or you can mail a check into the church office. And we ask, however you felt led to do so, that you do so with joy and generosity and gratitude for God.
Help us to see and know your love for us so that we may place all that we have and all that we are before you. Give us generosity and stewardship as we follow Jesus in the way of humility and love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue in prayer. God of transformation, God of love, we do look to you now. With all of the mix of feelings, of hopes and of doubts, of fears and of joys, we come before you, we pray for your Holy Spirit. And we pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear what you would say to us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So as I've been thinking about this week's gospel text, that thank you, Marcy, for uh, adjusting as we went. Uh, I, I love that story from Jonah. It's just uh, that whole story is amazing. Uh, but to think of him, uh, it'd be better for me to die, you know, just over and over. He's just so miserable. I've been thinking about what it might be like to be a salmon, living up the river, fighting for territory, you know, with other salmon. The, the bigger ones get the better spots in the river. They get the bigger flies. Uh, you know, there's only so much to go around. And so when it's time for them to swim out to the ocean, they keep on with the same value system. We're going to fight each other for space. We want to get to the ocean first because we want to get the best space down there. We want to get the best food to eat. And they get out there and suddenly everything's different. It's vast. There are no better spots than other spots. There's plenty of space for all the salmon. Plenty of food for all the fish. 
It makes me think of how we vie with one another in this world, imagining that the next world's going to be just like this one, and we sure hope that we'll get the better spots even there. Now, this is kind of what's going on in the Gospel of Matthew. The disciples are wondering about that coming kingdom, and just before today's text, in fact, they're asking Jesus, you know, well, we've given away everything we have to follow you. Will we get, you know, good stuff in the coming kingdom? He says, absolutely. And so will everybody else. A hundredfold return on their giving themselves away to follow me. Right after today's gospel lesson, we have it again. Jesus talks about he's going to go to the cross. He's come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then John and Jane's mother comes and says, yeah, okay, but can my boys sit at your right and left hand? Like, you know, the coming kingdom, we want to make sure we get, just like here, we got to fight for the best spots. And I just hear Jesus again and again trying to get it through to the disciples. The kingdom of heaven's not like that. And we can live now based on those values, because that ocean of grace is going to be here sooner than you think, and God's grace will be abundant for all. And so we come to today's text, a verse right before it, and the bookend at the end will be basically the same, saying, for many who are first will be last, And the last will be first. And in today's text, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out again about about nine o'clock, He found others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again at noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. At about five o'clock, he went out again and found others standing idle. And he said to them, why do you stand idle here all day? And they said, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you also go into my vineyard. When evening came, the landowner said to his manager, call all the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those who had been hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, They grumbled against the landowner, saying, these worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. I choose to give to these as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do as I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? And so the last will be first. And the first will be last. The word of the Lord. And they grumbled against the landowner. 
That's a bit shocking. After all, these are subsistence workers. These are people who hope when they go out in the morning that they're going to get work for the day. If they don't, their family doesn't eat. And there are many people still in our world today, that's the way they live, hoping today somebody will come by and give me work for the day, pay for the day. They got it. It's a good day. They got work. They got pay. They should be delighted. And they grumble. It's what happens to us, isn't it? Like we've got it good, things are well, our circumstances are at least decent, but something happens and suddenly we go from being grateful, thankful, joyful, to being miserable and angry and upset. It can happen in just a a moment. The circumstances haven't changed all that much. I mean, actually, for most of us, our whole life, you could say we've got it pretty good. But yet we turn that corner. It's amazing how quickly. You know, as a child, my uh, family lived overseas for a couple of years. My dad worked for the government and traveled a lot. He'd come back with, you know, slides, pictures. We'd see slideshows of different areas of the world. And I always, I think, had this idea in the back of my mind that it'd be wonderful to travel for my work, too. That was my model. And... So a few years into my ministry, uh, I stepped out of ministry for a few years and started doing some leadership training, consulting with businesses around the country, and found myself traveling. I was doing what I had kind of dreamed of doing. I loved the teaching, talking with people about the values behind leadership. It was a great experience. And not long after I had started doing that traveling, I started getting upgraded to first class. And I kind of liked that. And I would be up there and, you know, enjoying that, getting frequent flyer miles and be up there in first class. And, and then one Friday evening, it was time to go home, and they didn't have room in first class for me. I was so bummed. <laughs> I still remember getting on that airplane and trudging to the back of the airplane and taking a window seat. And I sat down there, and I looked out the window, and there was this beautiful full moon. I'm like, God, I'm so sorry. (laughs) I've got it so good. I'm actually traveling. I've got a good job. Things are... And I'm miserable because I have to sit and coach. It's amazing how we can have it so good, and somehow we turn that corner, and we're miserable in the midst of the plenty. It's a challenge for us. Our perspective can so quickly get out of whack. We focus on what we don't have rather than what we do have. It's simple, right? We focus on our worries about the future and what might happen rather than our hopes for the future and what might happen. We focus on the negative aspects of our situation rather than the positive. We choose to frame our situation negatively rather than framing it, looking at it in a positive way. I think of you know, so many of those stories, right? Thomas Edison, who failed at making light bulb about 10,000 times, we're told. But he said, I'm not calling it failure. I learned 10,000 times what doesn't work so that I could make what does work. How do we choose to frame the situation we're in? You know, we choose to compare ourselves to others. I was talking, you know, actually, I love it, our knitting group, and if you're not a part of it, you should join them. It's just a growing group that gathers each week, uh, laughing, talking. They were sharing words of thanksgiving this past week with each other. One of them, Ellen Erickson, said, as we were talking about this passage very briefly, she said, uh, Theodore Roosevelt had this quote, comparison is the thief of joy. I love that. Comparison is the thief of joy. And we start comparing ourselves. We got it so good. But you know those ones, they've got it better. Here are these laborers, envious, because others had it a little easier than they did. Maybe a lot easier than they did. The word in the Greek that's translated envious is actually evil eye. Isn't that interesting? And that word evil eye is used throughout the scriptures. It's 
this word that means greed or jealousy, covetousness, calculating reward, which is an interesting thing to think about. It, how we, we think, if I do this, I should get that. And often we get into a relationship, whether it's a friendship or even a marriage, and we get into the calculating of this relationship. And as soon as we do that, the evil eye has got control. Well, I'm doing this much, you need to do that much. And if you start counting in a relationship, the relationship's not going to go well. I mean, that's the way with us and God, marriage is like that. It's called a covenant. And a covenant is where two people give themselves to one another. Not a transaction where if, God, I do this for you, yeah, well, that's what we often pray, isn't it? I'm going to do this, God, and I hope that you'll give me that. It's not that kind of relationships. It's not transactional. That's an evil eye way of looking at relationships when we fall into that. There's a lack of generosity is what that evil eye means and leads to. The world we live in encourages that evil eye. It's the, the water that we swim in. The, the movies, oh, look at the way they live. The TV shows, whoa, look at where they are. Facebook, and you're like, wow, those folks are always happy. I don't know what's wrong with me. The list goes on. I think about students competing at school or parents of students competing with each other or out on the sports or in business or even with churches where we get envious of the church down the road. They're doing so well, looking so good. What's wrong with us? We compare. We lose our joy. The evil eye. Now, I'm not trying to argue against the free market system. I, probably the best we can come up with in a broken world. Competition has its place. It keeps us on our toes. There's something good about that. But we've got to know there have to be guardrails on that for our society, our nation, but also for us, especially for us as individuals, as followers of Jesus, because our ultimate values, our basic values are, are not that we want to do better than somebody else. It's we want everybody to do well. And the amazing thing about God's kingdom is that we can all do better. We can all working together, serving one another, loving one another. There's enough grace for all. And God calls us even in this broken world to live by the values of his coming kingdom. And I've thought about this recently. There's been a lot in the news. I guess there always is. But, you know, about this singer that comes through town. Amazing. You know, and makes $200 million. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot more than I make. <laughs> is she happier than I am? Maybe. Maybe not. But the reality is, if she is, it's not because of her circumstances. I mean, study after study shows us that it's not our circumstances that makes us happy, which is shocking, amazing. We keep chasing after happiness, joy, thinking if we can just get that, if we can just beat them, if we can, then we'll be happy. But study after study shows us, the scripture tells us, that joy, happiness does not come from that. There's an interesting study I learned about this past week of uh, paraplegics and lottery winners. And they studied, you know, which were happier when they first became paraplegics. You can imagine that they were much less happy than the people who won the lottery at the time they won the lottery. But remarkably, after a year, it was even. That's just shocking. It's not our circumstances that determine whether we're going to be happy, joyful. It's that internal perspective with which we look at our life and our situation, our circumstances. It's an amazing thing. The laborers in this parable, they got what they'd been promised. They had a good day of work and a good day of pay and they're grumbling and Jesus is teaching his disciples who are hoping that they're following Jesus is going to lead them to do better than even others who follow Jesus but kind of join in later. They're not right his central leaders. And Jesus, there's grace enough for all. I think of what Jonah said 
Or what we read earlier from Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good. You could just stop there, right? (laughs) The Lord is good to all. And his compassion is over all that he has made. The landowner says, I choose to give to these as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do as I choose with what belongs to me? We worship a God who chooses to give. Whether you like it or not, Jonah, (laughs) whether you like it or not, God is the God who gives grace to all. The offer is for everyone. And as we come into that kingdom, we're just going to be blown away. Our previous conceptions of what's most important will be washed away as we come into that abounding grace of God. So if you want to increase your joy, your happiness in this life, I want to offer you three specific things that we can do. We can, first of all, just notice our blessings. Notice, name, count your blessings. The laborers, they had blessings to count, but they stopped counting those and started counting what they were unhappy about. I think of Philippians chapter four. I just love this passage where the apostle Paul, writing to his beloved friends, he says, finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Like, we can choose what we're going to think about. We can choose to focus in on the negative and on what we're not getting. We can choose also to focus in on the grace of God, the generosity of God. Second thing we can do, and we talk about this a lot, but can't talk about it enough, really. Give thanks. Just be thankful. Practice that. I love that again at the the group, the knitting group, what they were doing when I walked in and heard them laughing. I said, what are you doing laughing in church? They're... We're sharing with each other what we're thankful for today. Be thankful and share those words of thanksgiving. You think they left more joyful? You know they did. Be thankful. It's contagious, actually. Practice generosity would be the third thing. Just practice. You cannot outgive God. Become a part of the flow of that grace, of that love, of that joy of God. Let you be a conduit, as we talked about in August, of that generosity, that grace. Here again, studies show that people who volunteer, that people who give generously of their finances, that these are happier people in our society. But we don't do it because of what we're going to get, right? Just like last week, we don't forgive just because... There's going to be some reward for us if we forgive. We forgive, we give, because that's just the way of life for the follower of Jesus. That's who God is, remember? I choose to give to you as I give to them. And we who follow Jesus, growing in his image, we pray day by day, we choose to give. We are just, that's our way of life. And of course, we come more and more alive as we live that life. In my devotions the other day, each day as I pray and meditate on scripture, I ask God, what's your word for me today? And uh, usually it's just one little word, but this time it was several together. I heard God telling me that when I begin to feel miserable, notice my blessings. When I begin to feel envious or covetous, be thankful. When I begin to feel greedy, wanting more, Be generous. When I begin to not trust God, to remember the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You know, our joy increases and the flow of that joy through us to others increases. 
when we have a God-centered perspective, when we truly trust, when we realize and believe that God's grace is sufficient, abounding for us and for all. Let's pray together. God of grace, we praise you today for your love, for your grace, for the fact that you are in your character, a God of love, a God who gives. May we trust you. May we have a God-centered perspective that trusts you and rejoices in your love. Grant us good perspective amid the challenges of our lives. And grant that we may experience the joy of sharing your joy, your love, your grace with others. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. joy it is to have our choir leading us in worship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.